Hello, Weirdo family. Today, through October 24th, I'll be away from the Weird Darkness studio filming a horror movie, so I won't be able to give updates on our Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser in the podcast, as I had to produce these episodes in advance. But don't let that stop you from donating. I will give an update when I get back from filming. In the meantime, if you'd like to follow me and how things are going on the movie set while I'm gone, I'll be posting updates and pics as often as I can to the Weird Darkness Facebook page. I'll place a link to that in the episode description. And now, on with the show. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Although you've likely never heard of Bladenboro, you might be surprised to learn that it's home to a very intriguing North Carolina vampire beast legend. In the early 1950s, locals reported a strange creature emerging from the woods and killing multiple livestock and dogs, leaving their mutilated bodies behind. This happened several different times within the course of a month, but the strangest thing was that the creature seemed mostly interested in drinking blood. Thus was born the Beast of Bladenboro legend that still thrives in the area. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… We've all heard of cryptids like Bigfoot, Mothman, the Loch Ness Monster, the Jersey Devil, the Dogman, and so on. But have you ever heard of a cryptid that isn't flesh and blood, but made of plants? The story of Isabella Guzman went viral on TikTok six years after she was convicted of the murder of her mother. During the trial, she claimed she was abused. Then she pleaded insanity. But one good thing did come from the trial – a serious discussion about mental illness. If you're a proponent of execution – no judgment here, just go with me – the only way to see that through is to have someone push the button, flip the switch, pull the trigger, or whatever methods being used in order to snuff out the life of the soon-to-be-dead inmate. Someone has to get their hands dirty, metaphorically speaking. And even if you think you'd have the stomach and determination to do the job, let me ask you this – would you be okay with literally getting your hands bloody? Would you survive as a medieval executioner using an axe to chop off your victims' heads? What would life be like with that job? But first, every part of the world seems to have its own share of cryptids, and sometimes creatures that are unique to that area. For example, Along with the ubiquitous Bigfoot, you may have heard about North Carolina's Moon-Eyed People or the Wampus Cat. But I'm guessing you've not heard about what some call the Vampire Beast of Bladenboro. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The story behind the vampire beast terrorizing Bladenboro is a long and strange one. Between footprints, animal corpses, and eyewitness sightings, it's clear that there is some sort of mysterious beast in the area, 
and no one is really sure what it is. Mysterious animal deaths still crop up in the area from time to time, leading some to believe the beast may still be on the loose. There are a few myths about vampires in the United States, and this one is certainly memorable. Whether you yourself have spotted the cryptid or whether you just enjoy the legends, it's interesting to ponder what's lurking out there in the woods and why gruesome mysteries like this remain unsolved. The first sighting of the beast happened back in 1953. On the evening of December 29th, a woman heard her neighbor's dogs causing a fuss outside at night. They were barking and whimpering as if in fear. She went out to check to see what the matter was. To her surprise, she reportedly found a large, cat-like creature that she thought was a mix between a lion and a bear. It slunk away into the darkness before she could get a decent look at it, however, leaving her reasonably shaken from the experience. But that wasn't all. In some accounts of the incident, the dogs did more than just bark. The creature came prowling back and ended up killing both dogs in a horrifying manner. Later on, there would be more sightings and more killings, but it was on that day that the Beast of Bladenboro was born. There was one chilling factor that set the beast apart from an average bear or wild dog. It seemed fixated on blood. When dogs and livestock began turning up dead, local authorities found that the animals had been drained of blood with only few drops left in the corpses. While some of the victimized animals were horrifyingly mutilated, some bodies were found simply with bites and broken bones and were flattened. One witness even recalls that it seemed the strange animal was drinking blood from one of the dogs it had killed. Newspapers, as you might guess, latched on to the notion that there was a bloodsucker about and began describing the beast as vampiric. This also gave rise to the notion that the beast might be something supernatural or mutated, as few animals in the world particularly feed off of solely blood. While this mystified and sensationalized the beast, it also frightened people, and they soon decided the beast had to be caught. While the beast took down livestock, including goats, pigs, and perhaps even horses, its preferred prey tended to be dogs, leading to further speculation that the vampire might be more cat-like than wolf-like, as cats are notorious enemies of dogs. After the first sighting in December, the beast re-emerged and went on a rampage. On New Year's Eve 1953, Woody Storm found two of his dogs gruesomely killed on his property. Both had obviously been brought down by something large, as they were not exactly small dogs and had been drained of blood. Over the next few days, reports came in from across the country, all reporting that dogs had been killed by some massive cat or bear or monster. The animals sometimes tore the dogs apart, drained their blood, or just dragged them off into the woods. A few of the poor animals were not found until later, dead and mutilated in the woods. But why did the beast particularly target dogs? Nothing's ever been proven. The other telltale sign that the beast had been at work was that the bodies of its victims found were terribly mutilated, and not just a slashed stomach either. The beast had decapitated its victims or at the very least smashed their skulls to the point of flattening them. Many of the bodies later found in the woods were completely missing their heads, and one rabbit was found completely decapitated but still warm, as if the creature had just snapped off its head in one bite before fleeing. Dogs were often found with their lower jaws torn completely off or smashed back to the point of being unrecognizable. This indicated that the creature was strong, and it cast serious doubt on later suggestions that the animal was merely a bobcat or stray hound. Another thing many witnesses reported is that the beast of Bladenboro made an absolutely chilling sound. While many accounts differ in the size and color of the beast, most agreed that its call sounded partly human in an unearthly way and truly unnerving. Some described it as the sound of a baby crying in pain somewhere outside. 
Others said it was like a woman screaming, as if she'd been stabbed or had been hurt. Some people even reported seeing the animal open its jaws to make the sound, so it was not the noise of one of its unfortunate canine victims dying. No matter how it was described, pretty much everyone agreed that the beast's call was positively blood-curdling. While the beast definitely seemed to prefer canine prey, it did once try to attack a human. On the evening of January 5, 1954, Mrs. C. E. Kinslaw was in her home when she heard some strange sounds outside. The dogs sounded like they were whimpering, and she went outside to see what the matter was. There, she saw a massive cat-like creature approaching her dogs, and it quickly turned its eyes on her. The beast rushed at her as if to attack her, and she screamed before running inside for help from her husband. Apparently frightened by her screams, the beast slunk back into the woods. The beast never attacked another human, seeming to prefer dogs and livestock. However, the incident made the papers, especially noting that there had been tracks left outside. It proved the beast was real and that it could be dangerous to people. After the mysterious and gruesome deaths of so many local animals, people who lived in Bladenboro decided it was time to take down the beast. In January of 1954, a massive group began to comb the forests and swamps, trying to find this mysterious creature. The hunt got so big, in fact, that big game hunters came from miles away and across state lines just for a shot at tracking down the creature. Of course, given the rough terrain in the area, it was difficult to track the beast, and even more difficult to catch it, and after a long while it passed, the mayor called off the hunt. But not before a tantalizing moment of near success. One man caught a wildcat in a trap, and newspapers circulated images saying that the beast had been caught. Not only do experts agree that the animal was far too small, but there were also more killings after the wildcat had been killed. It is incredibly unlikely that this cat was actually the fabled beast. As to what the beast is, nobody is sure, but there are plenty of theories. The most obvious is that the animal is some sort of mountain lion, also called a catamount or a cougar. But blood-sucking doesn't exactly make sense in the case of a cougar. So some experts have speculated that perhaps the animal lapped up the blood after crunching on the bones and bodies rather than actually sucking it out. Along those lines, a bobcat has also been suggested, even if most people agree that they're not big or strong enough to fit the beast's characteristics. Another theory says that the beast is actually a large dog that was raised by a local before escaping that was supposedly truly massive. Some others have said that it is simply a bear that people mistook for being cat-like in the dark. The Beast of Bladenboro seems to grow bigger and more frightening with each retelling of its legend. Because of all the attention and notoriety the animal received, some people were attracted to the beast myth for personal gain. Some hunters killed bobcats and displayed them as the legendary beast, even asking for payment for viewing. Some pranks, though, were more silly and harmless. One Bladenboro resident later confessed that he intentionally created fake evidence of the creature for attention. He and his friends found a large dog, possibly a greyhound, then took the animal to a creek where the bank was still soft. They then tied a bead of dried peas to its tail and turned it loose. The sound and feeling of the peas frightened the dog, and it leaped around creating strange and frantic paw prints in the mud. Then they went to reporters and said the tracks were from the beast. While these accounts were false, there were plenty more witnesses who claimed their sightings were genuine. The beast was spotted on the outskirts of the town of Bladenboro, North Carolina, which is located nearly an hour from any other cities and boasts a population of less than 2,000. In fact, one of the town's only real claims to fame is its legendary beast, and this is what put it on the map. News sources all along the coast and in many other states reported on these strange killings, and nearly overnight, Bladenboro became a recognizable name. When you think about it, though, North Carolina is a great habitat for cryptids. 
Bladenboro in particular is surrounded by both forests and swamps, which makes combing the area for signs of an unknown creature rather difficult. This proved especially true when locals tried to hunt down the beast after attacks became more frequent. Although the creature appeared on the scene and wreaked its worst havoc in the 1950s, the beast still surfaces from time to time. In 2003, more farm animals and dogs began to turn up with crushed bones, bite marks, and very little blood in their bodies. Strange tracks were also found near the bodies, leading people to believe that the beast was back at work. But it didn't just stop with dead livestock and pets. In 2013, a local family reported that their dog and three of their horses had been slaughtered in the night. The dogs had been barking, and when the son of the family, Tyler, investigated, he said he had seen a strange creature in the shadows running away from the body of a dead dog. The dead animals had been drained of blood, and given that the attack again happened in Bladenboro, people quickly linked the attack to the beast. Even though the beast has killed numerous family pets and livestock, the locals actually celebrate the creature rather than fear it now that its activity has somewhat subsided. Some older folks are reluctant to talk about it, but at the same time, as one local puts it, there is such a thing as too much publicity for a small town. As if to prove that, the town now has a festival called Beast Fest held annually. There's live entertainment, food, and admissions free to anyone who shows up. The family-friendly festival is meant to boost the small town and draw in tourism, capitalizing on its dark experience with a murderous feline cryptid. Around 10,000 people generally attend the festival, many of them hopeful that maybe, just maybe, they might catch a glimpse of the legendary beast of Bladenboro. Coming up on Weird Darkness, the story of Isabella Guzman went viral on TikTok six years after she was convicted of the murder of her mother. During the trial, she claimed she was abused. Then she pleaded insanity. But one good thing did come from the trial, a serious discussion about mental illness. Plus, would you survive living the life of a medieval executioner? We'll find out what day-to-day -day living was like for them outside of the swinging of an axe. These stories are up next. Weird Darkness is celebrating its ninth birthday this month, and we mark that on our calendars by holding a fundraiser each year in October. We raise money for organizations that help people who struggle with depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide and self-harm. It's called Overcoming the Darkness, and you can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. A gift of any amount will bring us that much closer to our goal of $5,000, and every dollar you give helps someone affected by depression, so no gift is too small. You can help us celebrate the podcast's birthday, celebrate the darkness of Halloween, and also help people climb out of the darkness that they're trapped in. To donate or get more information about overcoming the darkness and watch a video I created about it, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends Halloween night at midnight, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Isabella Guzman made headlines in 2013 when the then 18-year-old stabbed her mother, 47-year-old Yunmi Hoi, 79 times. Although the media portrayed Isabella Guzman as a killer, the case went in a new direction when Guzman claimed her mother had abused her for years leading up to the murder. The Isabella Guzman case eventually went to trial, where Guzman pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Six years later, 
Guzman's story went viral on TikTok, bringing the story of her mother's murder back into the public spotlight and opening a conversation about the stigmas surrounding mental illness. We're about to step back to 2013 to look at what led to Isabella Guzman to committing such a violent crime against her mother. In August 2013, Isabella Guzman was 18 years old and living with her mother and stepfather in Aurora, Colorado after dropping out of high school. Family members described the teenager as both affectionate and loving. Following her mother's murder, reporters interviewed Guzman's aunt, Melanie Guzman, who described her niece as a normal teenager. Her demeanor is pretty sweet. She's very coquette. I could see her yelling, screaming, and storming off and locking herself in her room and turning on her iPod. Melanie Guzman added that she couldn't imagine her niece becoming violent and that there was something more to it, apparently referring to the police investigation. For years, Isabella Guzman's mother, Yoon Mi Hoi, claimed her daughter was a difficult child. When Guzman was seven years old, Hoy even sent her daughter to live with her biological father, Robert Guzman. At the time of Hoy's murder, Guzman was living with her once again, but there was reportedly significant tension in the household. Guzman's stepfather, Ryan Hoy, later told the media that in the days leading up to his wife's murder, Guzman became threatening and disrespectful toward Yoon Mi Hoy, and that the mother and daughter fought often. Robert Guzman later said of his ex-wife, she tried really, really hard for her family, but Isabella didn't appreciate anything she did for her. On the afternoon of Wednesday, August 28, 2013, Yoon Mi Hoi called police to report Guzman's threatening behavior, telling them she was afraid of her daughter. Police responded to the scene and reportedly informed Guzman that her mother had a right to kick her out of the house if she didn't abide by her mother and stepfather's rules. Guzman's father, later drove to Hoy's home to speak with his daughter. Robert Guzman later told the media, I went to talk to Isabella, and we sat down in the backyard looking at the trees and the animals, and I started to talk to her about the respect that people should have for their parents. Robert stated that he thought the conversation had been productive, but he received a call only hours later that Guzman had murdered Hoy. Just before 10 p.m. on August 28, 2013, Ryan Hoy was at home when he heard a thumping sound coming from upstairs, as well as his wife's voice calling out his name. Yoon Mi Hoy had returned from working at the portrait studio she owned around 9.30 p.m. and gone upstairs to take a shower, but when Ryan Hoy reached the bathroom, he noticed blood seeping from under the door. Hoy claimed Guzman was holding the door shut so at 10.05 p.m. he ran back downstairs to call 911 and ask police to once again come to the family's home on the 2600 block of South Lima Street in Aurora, Colorado. By the time police arrived at 10.16 p.m., Yoon Mi Hoi was dead, and Isabella Guzman was nowhere to be found. When Ryan Hoy returned to the bathroom after calling 911, Guzman opened the door. Inside the bathroom, he reportedly saw Guzman holding a knife and covered in blood. Yoon Mi Hoi was dead on the bathroom floor, and a baseball bat lay near her lifeless body. According to an affidavit, Guzman was just staring straight ahead when she walked past Ryan Hoy. She apparently said nothing to her stepfather before fleeing the home. Hoy also claimed he heard his wife, a Jehovah's Witness, shout, Jehovah, prior to Guzman opening the bathroom door. Authorities pronounced Yoon Mi Hoi dead at the scene after administering CPR, and an autopsy later revealed Guzman had stabbed her a total of 79 times, 31 wounds to the face, and 48 to the neck. Before police and medical personnel arrived at the scene, Isabella Guzman left her family home, wearing only a pink sports bra and turquoise shorts. Police found her roughly 16 hours later, She'd been hiding in an office building's parking garage located only a mile or so from the family home. Police found Guzman after they received a call from someone seeing a body in a car. Upon police's arrival, they found the car empty, though Guzman had left some personal effects behind, including items tying her to Hoy's murder. The search for Isabella Guzman came to a dramatic end around 2 p.m. on August 29th, 
when three officers drew their weapons on her after seeing Guzman attempting to leave the parking garage. Guzman was taken into custody, where she was held without bail. As investigators began collecting evidence related to Hoy's murder, more information came to light about the hours leading up to the killing. The day before, Tuesday, August 27th, Ryan Hoy claimed Guzman spit in her mother's face. Guzman then wrote Hoy an email that said, among other things, you will pay. Yunmi Hoy didn't see the email until Wednesday morning, when she eventually decided to call police. After police left, Guzman reportedly went to her room for the rest of the afternoon. Ryan Hoy later told authorities he had seen Guzman in the kitchen around 8.30 p.m., only an hour before Hoy returned from work and Guzman attacked her. Following her arrest, Guzman told law enforcement her mother and stepfather had abused her for years, leading up to the events of August 28, and that the pair were incredibly strict with her. Guzman stated, My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses, and I left the religion when I was 14 and the abuse at home worsened after I quit. In addition to the abuse Guzman allegedly endured while living with her mother, she also claimed an employee at the Colorado Mental Health Institute sexually assaulted her in a utility closet sometime in 2015. Guzman reported the assault at the time, but said there were two more incidents with the employee. Guzman later said that I was afraid that if I didn't do what he wanted that he could ruin my life. In the summer of 2014, Isabella Guzman was put on trial for her mother's murder. She faced a first-degree murder charge, which could have resulted in the death penalty. However, doctors brought in as expert witnesses told the court Guzman was in fact schizophrenic and didn't believe her mother was her mother at the time of the murder. One doctor described disturbing delusions Guzman had reportedly experienced for years and claimed she believed her mother was actually a woman named Cecilia, whom Guzman believed she had to kill in order to save the world. Guzman's mental illness reportedly also accounted for her atypical behavior in court the day after murdering Yun Mi Hoi. In addition to refusing to leave her cell, which delayed court proceedings, Guzman smirked and made faces at camera crews once she entered the courtroom. Based on doctors' testimonies, the prosecutor for Guzman's case, 18th Judicial District Attorney George Broschler, called for Guzman to be placed in a psychiatric facility. Broschler argued before the court that people convicted for crimes knew they did something wrong. However, Broschler stated, in this particular case, I am convinced, based on the evidence that I've seen and the information that's been presented in court, that this woman did not know right from wrong, and she could not have acted differently than she did given the significant schizophrenia and paranoid delusions, audible visual hallucinations that she was going through. Guzman was subsequently found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo, Colorado. Isabella Guzman's name resurfaced in the media in November 2020 when she requested release from the Colorado Mental Health Institute. Guzman, then 25, stated that at the time of her mother's murder, I was not myself and I have since been restored to full health. Guzman added that she was no longer a danger to herself or others, criteria that prosecutor George Broschler had specified Guzman needed to meet when she was first sentenced to a psychiatric facility. Broschler stipulated at the time that Guzman could spend days or the rest of her life in the hospital, depending on how much treatment she required. In the summer of 2021, Guzman was eventually granted approval to leave the hospital in order to meet with her therapist. Prior to being granted partial release, Guzman said of killing her mother, if I could change it or if I could take it back, I would. As news of Guzman's bid to be released from the Colorado Mental Health Institute surfaced in the media, her story went viral on TikTok. While some were sympathetic to Guzman's plight, other creators on the app played the 2013 court footage of Guzman glaring at camera crews in tandem with Eva Max's 2018 song, Sweet But Psycho, which included the lyrics, Oh, she's sweet but a psycho. A little bit psycho. At night she's screaming. I'm mama mama out of my mind. The TikToks made about Guzman quickly became the source of much controversy, with many claiming the videos either romanticized or stigmatized mental illness. 
The reaction to the videos reportedly showed the deep divide in how the public perceived Isabella Guzman and her 2013 actions. And before I leave this story, if you know someone who may be in a mental health crisis, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com for numerous resources for a variety of mental health-related situations. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. It is no surprise that the medieval period was filled with all kinds of undesirable jobs. There were leech collectors, cesspool cleaners, serfs, and gong farmers, to name a few. But one vocation that was perhaps one of the toughest was the job of the medieval executioner. Theirs was one of the darkest, most taboo jobs of the Middle Ages. Whether employed in splendid royal courts or backwater petty castles, these vicious headsmen had a singular purpose – to do the job that very few could or wanted to do. Theirs was the role of taking lives, tightening the noose, or decapitating those who were destined for an early grave. Their axes knew no class or creed. The sharp iron culled both king and peasant. During much of the early medieval period, as well as the centuries that followed, crime and lawlessness were rampant throughout the world. From Europe to Asia and the Middle East, evil was an everyday occurrence. Rapes, thievery, murder, heresy, and leprosy – all manner of sin and decadence ran rampant in the unruly medieval world under the auspices of death itself. But where there is lawlessness, there is also justice albeit sometimes a cruel one. Mercy was not the usual approach to solving crimes, much to the disadvantage of the budding criminal of the period. This means that once dealt, justice was swift and brutal, a determined and definite retribution against the usurpation of the order of society. In short, the death penalty was often the sentence. As the earliest epoch of the Middle Ages slowly advanced into a new, slightly more developed period, it also saw the rise of a new vocation. Someone was needed to perform the role that no one wanted. That was the executioner's vocation. From as early as the 1200s, the societies of Western and Central Europe were increasingly requiring an official position that would satisfy their needs for delivering capital punishment to their convicts. Prominent cities throughout France, Germany, and England required skilled executioners to act as the divine hand of justice appointed by the state and the royal court. One of the earliest documented official executioner positions dates to 1202, when a prominent headsman, Nicolas Johan, nicknamed La Justice, was appointed the Vicomte, an official executioner of the Normandy town of Caux. From then on, this official position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe. But even before that period, and certainly well after it, the role of the executioner was definitely a troubled one, straddling a gray area between good and evil, and between acceptance and repugnance. Executioners were very much ostracized. Death, and moreover murder, always had a difficult position in society. When done by a mass of people, as in lynching, murder was no longer a taboo act. The group erased the perpetrator. But once an individual took the matter into their own hands and performed a murder, the situation was different. And such was the predicament of the executioner. A person in this position, who was known to be the headsman, was seen as a troubled person, a sinner beyond redemption, and simply put, a killer. The masses could not accept the wanton taking of a life on command and could not comprehend the state of mind that hid behind the eyes of the headsman. One good example of this viewpoint of the masses can be observed from the many writings and memoirs from the Middle Ages, and chiefly the writings of Josef de Maistre. Here's a part of his observations of the character of an executioner. Quote, this head, this heart, are they made like ours? Do they not have something odd or foreign to our nature? 
On the exterior, he, the executioner, is made just as we are. He is born like us. But he is an extraordinary being. Is he a man? Unquote. The truth is not very far. A medieval executioner had a hard time in the society around him. In many, if not most, cultures of the medieval world, an executioner was an ostracized, shunned person who belonged to a markedly different caste of society. Even though they sometimes enjoyed financial benefits and could earn reasonable amounts from their work, these people still suffered in solitude and lived life on the margins of society simply because of their vocation. To freely deliver death, torture, and all manner of foulness on another person was seen as reason enough for the people to look down on an executioner and shun him. In most countries, executioners and their families lived on the peripheries of cities, well away from the main residences. They also couldn't be buried like the rest of the citizens. Their graves were separated from the main graveyard, marked and much less elaborate. The executioners had to be recognizable even when off-duty, much like Jews, lepers, and prostitutes during the Middle Ages. They too had to wear a special marking on their person at all times. And the ostracizing was similar outside of Europe. In Japan, for example, an executioner was extremely discriminated against and denigrated. They were exclusively from the Burakuman class, the lowest social caste of Japan. In the Ottoman Empire, no citizen could be an executioner. This vocation was reserved exclusively for the Roma Gypsies. This fact alone separated them in the Ottoman society, and they were looked down upon due to their cruelty and unflinching approach to all the gruesome tasks. These Roma caravans and throngs were an essential part of the baggage trains of Ottoman armies. They were tasked with the cruelest tortures and executions against the subjugated peoples of the empire. The Ottoman Roma executioners were widely feared for their cruel methods, such as impalement on a stake. This was the execution method used against brigands, thieves, and captured freedom fighters in occupied lands. The medieval executioner, especially in the early periods, was actually much more than just an executioner. One could hardly expect to have a fresh head to chop off every day, and thus different means of earning money had to be found. That is why the executioner was tasked with many more jobs, none of them decent. In fact, an executioner never had a single vocation in the early medieval period. An executioner earned his daily bread by doing many unsavory tasks, which were shunned by the rest of society. In France, they were known as masters of high and low works. For example, they would tax the prostitutes and lepers of the town, especially those that were illegally there. An executioner that found an illegal leper begging on the streets had the right to confiscate all the belongings and money of the leper and to fine him an additional amount. They were also well known as knackers, people tasked with collecting animal carcasses around town, as well as killing sick, dying, and old animals. The carcasses would then be rendered to gather anything usable – bat, hides, tallow, or bone meal. This was a shunned and foul job, but very lucrative. In many areas, knackers were also exclusively executioners. An executioner was also employed to oversee the town's prostitutes, another task that was seen as disreputable and decadent. These men were tasked with exacting a tribute from the prostitutes, a fixed sum, several times per year. Curiously, the medieval executioner, particularly in France and Western Europe, was tasked with managing the town's stray dogs – in what way, you can guess – as well as farm animals kept illegally in town premises. For example, in Dijon, France, the law declared that no citizen may keep any sort of pigs in the town premises. It was the job of the executioner to kill any pig that was found in town. He was in his rights to cut off the head and keep it for himself as payment. Another shunned job was related to gong farming, cesspits, latrines, and similar foul fecal aspects of the medieval society. While these jobs were highly degrading, unsanitary, filthy, and ostracized, they were nonetheless lucrative, and executioners were often in charge of them. 
But even when they had a range of tasks that were in a sense critical to the functioning of the town, the executioners were still ostracized. They were not allowed to come into contact with the upstanding, well-off citizens of the town and were thus put into the corner with the same social outcasts they had authority over. This shunning throughout the medieval period slowly drove executioner families to endogamy, the practice of marrying people that belonged to the same background and social caste. Executioners almost exclusively married women who came from executioner families themselves, and in that way they almost created small, separate executioner communities. In time, those headsmen that were employed in the royal courts, their sons and their grandsons, all were in the family business. This saw the rise of many prominent hereditary executioner dynasties, which were often well-off, infamous, tasked with relieving some highly important individuals. In France, there was the Guillaume dynasty of Paris executioners, which was prominent in the business for more than a century. They were succeeded by the even more famous Sanson family, whose offspring, Charles Henry Sanson, would execute Louis XVI with a guillotine. Then there was the Desmorest dynasty, an offshoot of the Guillaumes, which gave France of the period more than 50 prominent executioners. In Western Europe, there was the prominent D'Alembourg dynasty of executioners who performed their role across Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and the Netherlands. Execution methods were many, and most notably they were done by the axe, the sword, the noose, or garret. It wasn't always easy to complete the task. History remembers many notable cases of clumsy executioners, which resulted in some botched and prolonged capital punishments. One example is the execution of James Scott, 1st Duke of Monmouth, 1st Duke of Buccleuch in 1685. He was executed by the infamous Jack Ketch, the executioner employed in the court of King Charles II. Ketch was infamous for his botched executions, which could have been done on purpose out of a sadistic nature. When the Duke of Monmouth was on the chopping block, he specifically implored Ketch in front of many gathered witnesses to grant him a swift death, unlike the ones before. He gave Jack Ketch six guinea and vouched that his servants would give more gold to the executioner if the death was swift. Nonetheless, the execution was botched and extremely unpleasant. It took Ketch eight hacks to finally sever the head. The gathered masses were enraged and attempted to lynch the executioner without success. Today, we are shown the slightly romanticized, perhaps inaccurate image of the medieval executioner as a hooded, secretive, and mysterious death dealer, while the reality could have been very different. It was difficult for an executioner to remain anonymous. His post and his vocation was known by all, and thus a hood and a mask would have been pointless. And we can now understand that the position of an executioner was almost always discriminated against. Taking lives, no matter how lowly or sinful they are, has never been an easy task, and it plunged the medieval executioners into the realm of social outcasts, forcing them to earn their money by doing all the gruesome and degrading jobs that were on offer, from collecting carcasses and burying bodies to managing stray dogs and overseeing the clearance of cesspools. Such was the hard life of the headsman. And if their lives of solitude and despair drove them to crime and murder, they could end up on the other side of the axe. All necks were the same to the sharp iron of the executioner's blade. When Weird Darkness returns, we've all heard of cryptids like Bigfoot, Mothman, the Loch Ness Monster, the Jersey Devil, the Dogman, and so on. But have you ever heard of a cryptid that isn't flesh and blood, but made of plants? October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Chantel wrote in saying, I had fairly aggressive postpartum depression three years ago. 
I work as a reservist in the Canadian Armed Forces and full-time as a correctional officer. I didn't know about the Weird Darkness podcast when I was dealing with my postpartum. However, due to my past medical history and my two jobs that almost guarantee me to have some type of mental illness in the future, I am glad that there is a soft place to fall other than the usual government-funded sites. Chantel is right. The organizations that we're raising funds for this month, Seven Cups, iFred, and the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline are all funded by donors like you and me who understand the importance of these resources being available. You can make a donation now of any amount by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Or click the link in the show notes. Cryptozoology, or cryptids for the common folk, has fascinated humankind for thousands of years, beginning as early as the 15th century BC. While media has glamorized the field, drawing images of wild-eyed creature hunters chasing anomalous beasts into the night, cryptozoology is really just the study of unknown, legendary, or extinct animals whose existence or survival is disputed or unsubstantiated. But reports of strange organisms don't stop at the animal variety. Enter cryptobotany, sometimes also called cryptophytology, or simply the study of plant cryptids. Just like its animal counterparts, this field of study focuses on the bizarre plants of folklore and legend that have evaded scientific confirmation. While there may not be any captivating security camera footage or blurry photographs of these elusive plants, some reports are surprisingly compelling. Some flora cryptids you could tentatively approach and feed plant food. Others might make you the plant food. Devil's Snare, Devil's Snare. It's deadly fun, but will sulk in the sun. While many only associate the Devil's Snare with one of many trials guarding the Philosopher's Stone in Harry Potter, this terrifying plant has a longer, more frightening history than children's fantasy can convey. Deep within the innermost swamps of Nicaragua, a vampiric vine awaits its next victim from whom it can drain blood. Natives to the area named it the Devil's Snare and described it as an octopus-like plant that not only captures its prey but seems to somehow absorb it. One eyewitness report claimed to have encountered this deadly plant near Lake Nicaragua after hearing sounds of pain and terror from his dog. When he found the source, he discovered his dog entangled by a network of roots and fibers covered in thick, adhesive gum. As the eyewitness struggled to cut his dog free, the plant fought back, wrapping its vines around his hands and leaving his flesh red and blistered. Thankfully, he managed to free his petrified pup, although it was wounded with strange suction marks where the vines had made contact with the skin. After his ordeal, he asked locals about the plant and learned it was well-known and feared by the community. Another report from Africa in 1852 dubbed a similar plant a vegetable serpent, describing it as a spotted serpent that drags itself along on the ground with a sickly flower for a head, a white and soft flesh, and a cartilaginous frame filled with yellow marrow. This report had no mention of vulnerability to sunlight but should you encounter one in the wild, perhaps try a flashlight. Have you heard of the tree that eats cows? It was midday on October 18, 2007, and young Pushpalatha from the small village of Patrame, India, made her way through the forest to visit a local shop. Her normal day ground to an abrupt halt, however, when she witnessed a tree lift a struggling cow by its hindquarters from the ground. Despite the cow's writhing, the tree held fast and tangled its limbs around the animal's tail and hind legs. Understandably frightened, Pushpalatha ran to get her mother and a local farmer working on a nearby fence. While her mother warned her not to touch the tree, the farmer, Basana, quickly jumped in and cut the tree's branches to release the cow. The tree reportedly did not release its iron grip on the cow until it was cut down. As the story went viral across the early internet, 
The owner of the rescued cow told reporters trees like this were known locally as pilimara, or tiger trees, and were sometimes mentioned in folk songs. Another villager recalled a similar event in which a tiger tree ensnared a bull and a group of villagers had to cut the branches to release the animal. They also claimed tiger trees could be climbed if the tree was pierced with an iron sickle first, as iron is believed to have power over carnivorous trees. Unfortunately, the original reporting on these incidents is a bit garbled, so it's hard to say if these events are truly separate or different accounts of the same events. While localized to India, this story seems to ring true with other stories of carnivorous trees around the world and the power of protection iron offers from spirits and monsters. The Leshy has had some moments of stardom in recent years, from being featured as an enemy in the video game Cult of the Lamb to getting a moment in the limelight as Leshen in Netflix's The Witcher. However, this plant cryptid celebrity isn't an invention of the modern world. In fact, the Leshy comes from Slavic mythology and was seen as a god of the forests and hunting. He was considered a wild and spiteful being who prowled the deepest backwoods of Eastern Europe. Legend describes him as a giant, gaunt man with tangled green hair covering his body and skin rough like tree bark, but that wasn't his only form. This tree man was no friendly ent from Lord of the Rings. Leshy was also known to be a shapeshifter that sought to trick those who walked his woods and lead them to their demise. Many stories accuse him of kidnapping children, likely used to frighten naughty kids, while others framed him as more of a neutral trickster spirit that guarded the forest and could often be heard singing, laughing, or even whistling in the woods. Roped off by tangled vines and roots, corralled by nine-foot-tall saw grass and guarded by unknowable murky depths, Florida swamps could be hiding anything. Gators, exotic pets turned loose, spiders that are clearly God's mistake, and, of course, the Moss Man. Tales of this seven-foot-tall bipedal humanoid made of moss and vegetation date as far back as the 1500s, when a young girl from the local tribe was captured, killed, and beheaded, after which her attackers tied her head to a tree in the swamp. The tribe's medicine man allegedly used his magic to call upon the spirits of the swamp to seek out vengeance, causing the girl's head to take a human form of weeds, branches, and other vegetation to hunt down her murderers. Other versions of this story claim the medicine man created a golem of vegetation to keep away the pillaging Spaniards. Aside from his great height, the moss man is said to have eyes that glow in amber or reddish hue and possess a hypnotic quality. But a sighting in 1978 firmly wove the moss man into folklore when a couple strolling along a Boca Raton beach along the Everglades reported seeing a humanoid figure made of moss, grass, and leaves. They claimed he glared at them with glowing red eyes, prompting them to flee. When they returned later, the creature was gone and only bits of Spanish moss remained strewn about the beach. Humanity's fascination with carnivorous plants has gripped us for centuries. After all, plants and trees are often seen as vibrant, life-giving sentinels of nature who just want water and sunlight. The idea of certain ones being stone-cold killers of insects or small mammals feels strangely personal. What if your monstera plant or oak tree in the backyard goes after humans? Well, that's exactly what legend says happened to the Yate Veo, a well-known carnivorous tree found in Central and South America, Africa, and on the shores of the Indian Ocean. Described as having a thick, stout trunk and long tendril-like branches used to catch its prey, some reports even claim it has an eye to locate potential dinner. In 1881, a letter was published from the German explorer Karl Leik describing a terrible tree called the Yateveo and how it ate members of the Madoko tribe of Madagascar. He notably described his own encounter with the tree as it coiled its tendrils around a filly, strangling the young horse with the cruel swiftness and savage tenacity of anacondas fastening upon their prey. Although the story was later revealed to be a fictitious work of writer Edmund Spencer for the newspaper New York World, the appearance of similar stories of carnivorous plants and trees in other parts of the world 
that cow-eating tree of India, for example, raises some interesting questions. First spotted in the abundant Honey Island Swamp of Louisiana in 1963, the Honey Island Swamp Monster has long been blamed for the death of animals and the unexplained disappearances of local children. Sometimes described as a cross between an alligator and a chimpanzee, the Honey Island Swamp Monster stands over seven and a half feet tall and weighs between 400 to 500 pounds with a thick coat of matted swamp weed and grayish hair. While this has earned it the nickname Louisiana Wookie, this doesn't account for its yellow reptilian eyes and the stench of death, the latter of which many attribute to the natural smell of marshlands. Hunters made early sightings of the Honey Island Swamp Monster, reporting a towering humanoid mass of plant matter prowling the swamps and leaving webbed, three-toed footprints in its wake. A rather unique legend surrounding this swampy beast involves an alleged train wreck that occurred near Pearl River in the early 1900s. The story goes that a train of exotic circus animals, namely chimpanzees, escaped in the accident and bred with alligators. Delightfully fantastical as the myth may be, monkeys and alligators cannot interbreed. Others speculate this swampy monster is just Bigfoot, adapted for a more aquatic environment. Whether it's swamp weed coming to life or a marsh-type Bigfoot, Honey Island residents and visitors still see this mysterious entity in the swamp to this very day. Cats are often accused of being a bit prickly, according to dog lovers, but this plant cryptid deserves the reputation. The cactus cat is described as a bobcat-like creature with thorns for fur, sharp protruding bones, and a branched tail. Most sightings have been reported in the southwestern desert of the U.S., most often in California, Nevada, and New Mexico, although there have been a few sightings in Colorado. Early 19th century legends of the cactus cat claim this creature came out at night to slash open cacti and drink the fermented sap within to get a nice buzz and stumble about. While they were reportedly not aggressive and rarely attacked humans unless they stole its beloved cactus booze, contemporaries of the time claimed the cactus cat had a haunting wail that filled the desert night air, accompanied by the chalky sound of its bones rubbing against each other. Named from the Arabic word kafir, meaning a non-believer in Islam, the kipra is a Philippine creature often called a tree giant. With its towering seven to nine foot height and hairy muscular physique, sightings often mention a powerful odor from the cigars it smoked and the wearing of an indigenous northern Philippine loincloth. Its name is deeply tied to early Arabs and the Moors, who used it to refer to non-Muslims, but it was later co-opted by the Spanish to prevent Filipinos from assisting escaping African slaves brought to Latin America. Despite the name's sordid past, the creature called the capre, or capri, or however you pronounce it, is said to dwell in big trees, wears a belt of invisibility, and possesses a magical white stone that grants the wishes of any who obtain it. Those who claim to have seen the capri, capre, whatever, reports rustling tree branches without cause or hearing loud laughter from an unseen being. Others recall seeing plumes of smoke with no source or big red eyes glaring at them from the trees. A Thailand-based plant cryptid is supposedly spotted in the infamous and perilous jungles, appearing half-human and half-plant. While they're known for throwing rice rocks at those passing through the jungle, the Nari Pon or Nirapon actually have an origin in Buddhist mythology. According to legend, Vesantara's wife often went into the forest to collect fruits, but feared attacks from the hermits and yogis who lived there due to her beauty. The god Indra created twelve special Nirapon trees that would bear fruits resembling the wife's beauty to distract the men and allow her to collect the fruits in peace. It's said the men would take the fruits back home and, after making love to them, would sleep for four months and lose all their powers. Two alleged specimens of this plant cryptid are housed at a sacred temple in Bangkok, Thailand, but without permission to examine them, it's difficult to say if they are legitimate evidence of the Nari Pon or if they will remain a legend. Hailing from Central Asia, the vegetable lamb of Tartary was believed to grow sheep like a tree grows a fruit, 
connected to the plant by an umbilical cord. The vegetable lamb was described in Henry Lee's 1887 book The Vegetable Lamb of Tartary to be both living animal and plant. Beliefs surrounding whether the vegetable lamb is flesh and blood like a normal lamb or more plant-like have shifted over time, along with speculation about whether or not it could survive without the umbilical cord to the plant. Interestingly, when comparing the vegetable lamb to similar tales, the Yadua of Jewish folklore is a very close match. The Yadua lore features a lamb that's sprouted from a stern growing directly from the earth. Severing the connection between lamb and stem would be the only way to kill the creature, so its bones could be used during prophetic ceremonies. In some versions of the tale, the lamb plant is actually dangerous and will capture any poor soul foolish enough to wander within its reach. With these similarities, Jewish folklore may be the origin of the vegetable lamb of Tartary. Thanks for listening, and be sure to stick around for the bloopers at the end. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors you heard about during the show, find all of my social media, listen to audiobooks I've narrated, sign up for the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host, visit the store for Weird Darkness merchandise, and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes. Plant-Based Cryptids was written by Amanda Boyson for Graveyard Shift. Isabella Guzman, the viral teenage killer, is by Patrick Thornton for Unspeakable Crimes. Life as a Medieval Executioner was written by Alexa Bukovic for Ancient Origins. The Beast of Bladenborough is by Laura Allen for Ranker. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 12, verse 13. A sinner is trapped by his sinful talk, but a godly person escapes trouble. And a final thought. If you are not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. But the strangest thing, but the strangest thing, strangest, but the strangest thing, strangest. It is incredibly unlikely that this cat was actually the fabled beats. That this cat was actually the fabled beats. Yes, the fabled vegetables. They then tied a band. They then tied a bay, 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 uh. In Japan, for example, an executioner was extremely discriminated against and did was extremely discriminated against were an essential part of the baggage trains of Ottoman El These Roma caravans and throng These Roma caravans and throngs were an essential part of the baggage trains of Ottoman M Ottoman were essential part <sighs> In France there was the Guillaume dynasty of Paris executioners which executioners shish, shish. One example is the execution of James Scott, first duke of Monmouth, first duke of Monmouth, first duke of Bu Bucluche. Bukluchi, Bukluk, Bukluk, Buckaroo. That's what it is. First Duke of Buckaroo. That must be what it is. In 1881, a letter was published from German explorer Karl Like, sometimes German explorer Karl, Karl, Karl.